What lies hidden in the icy depths of our solar system? What if our cosmic neighbors harbor secrets capable of overturning our understanding of the universe? Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we plunge into an extraordinary journey to the farthest reaches of our celestial neighborhood. From the geysers of Enceladus to the mysterious gravitational waves of Jupiter, via the astonishing storms of Uranus, our solar system has not ceased to amaze us. But before you set off on a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you and have a great trip. Let's leave planet Earth and plunge into the burning heart of our solar system, our star, the Sun. The Parker Solar Probe Mission, one of NASA's most significant missions, aims to explore the Sun and its environment in greater depth than ever before. Launched in August 2018, the mission's main objective is to analyze the Sun's outer atmosphere, known as corona, as well as the solar wind. Its aim is to resolve scientists' long-standing questions about the Sun, such as why the corona is warmer than the solar surface, and how the solar wind is generated. Parker's findings on the Sun's continuous ejection of matter and energy will be invaluable in improving the scientific models used to study and predict near-Earth space weather. The new data will also enrich our understanding of star formation and evolution. In addition, this information will play an important role in protecting astronauts and technology in space. The Parker probe's observations close to the Sun during two unprecedented close flybys provide new data on the mechanisms responsible for the solar wind. The mission also studied the dust present in the coronal environment while spotting extremely small particle acceleration events, undetectable from Earth, some 150 million kilometers from the Sun. One of the major discoveries made by the Parker Solar Probe is that the Sun's magnetic field is far more complex than previously thought. This complexity is behind many solar events, such as solar flares. One type of vent in particular has attracted the attention of scientific teams. Reversals in the direction of the magnetic field, emanating from the sun, integrated with the solar wind. These reversals, nicknamed yawing, appear to be a very common phenomenon in the flow of the solar wind within Mercury's orbit, lasting from a few seconds to several minutes as they pass over the probe. However, they don't seem to be present if we move away from this zone, making them undetectable without flying directly through this solar wind, as Parker does. During a reversal, the magnetic field turns back on itself until it points almost directly at the Sun. These laces, along with other observations of the solar wind, could provide early clues to the mechanisms that heat and accelerate the solar wind. This information not only helps us to better understand the causes of solar wind and space weather affecting the Earth, but also helps us to understand a fundamental process in how stars function and how they release magnetic energy into their environment. Although we have made significant progress thanks to the Parker probe, there is still much to discover about the origins and characteristics of the solar wind. From the probe's measurements, researchers have uncovered some surprising clues as to how the sun's rotation affects the flow of the solar wind. Close to Earth, the solar wind passes in front of our planet as if moving in almost straight lines or radially, like the spokes of a bicycle wheel, from the sun in all directions. However, since the sun rotates as it releases the solar wind, 
the ladder should receive a thrust synchronized with this rotation. When Parker ventured some 32 million kilometers or 20 million miles from the Sun, the researchers obtained their first observations of this effect. They found that the extent of this lateral motion was much stronger than expected, but that it also transformed faster than expected into a strictly radial flow. This phenomenon masks the effects at greater distances. The Sun's enormous extended atmosphere naturally influences the star's rotation. Understanding this transition point in the solar wind is key to understanding how the Sun's rotation slows down over time, with implications for our star's life cycles, its potentially violent past, as well as for other stars and the formation of protoplanetary disks, those dense disks of gas and dust surrounding young stars. Parker also observed the first direct evidence that dust begins to lighten at around 11 million kilometers or 7 million miles from the Sun, an effect theorized for nearly a century, but impossible to measure until now. These observations were made with the probe at a distance of around 6.4 million kilometers or 4 million miles from the Sun. Scientists have long suspected that close to the Sun, dust would be heated to high temperatures, transforming into gas and creating a dust-free region around the star. At the observed rate of thinning, scientists expect to see a totally dust-free zone at a distance of around 3.2 to 4.8 million kilometers, or 2 to 3 million miles from the Sun. This dust-free zone would indicate a place where the dust material has been evaporated by the sun's heat, becoming part of the solar wind that then passes through the Earth. On the other hand, Parker's instruments have measured several unprecedented events, so small that all trace of them is lost before reaching the Earth. These instruments have also detected a rare type of particle explosion with a particularly high ratio of heavier elements. This suggests that both types of event may be more common than scientists previously thought. Solar energetic particle events are important because they can occur suddenly and cause near-Earth space weather, potentially dangerous for astronauts. Understanding the sources, acceleration, and transport of these solar energetic particles will help us to better protect humans in space in the future. In addition, the Parker probe observed proton beams with velocities whose distributions resemble the shape of a hammerhead. This means that proton velocities are widespread in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. These observations coincide with strong circular electromagnetic waves. These results suggest that these hammerhead distributions appear when proton beams, aligned with a magnetic field, create waves and then disperse due to these waves. The probe's data revealed for the first time that whistle mode waves propagate towards the sun. This discovery is important, as these waves can interact with high-energy particle beams that are also heading towards the sun, but only if the waves travel parallel to the surrounding magnetic field. Among the discoveries is a new understanding of the behavior of the solar wind near the sun, Near the Earth, the solar wind appears to be a relatively uniform flow that can interact with the Earth's magnetic field and cause technological disturbances. However, close to the Sun, Parker's observations show a complex dynamic system, similar to an estuary where a river flows into the ocean. For the first time, scientists can study the solar wind from its source, the Sun's corona as one would observe a stream at the origin of a river. This offers a very different perspective from that of which the solar wind impacts the Earth. The observations also revealed information about the dust between the planets and the effects of dust grain impacts on the probe. 
They detailed the presence of different dust populations, including meteoroids in elliptical and hyperbolic orbits, as well as trapped nanograins that could be a source of captured ions. The probe also detected meteoroid impacts, notably before and after its passage to the closest point to the sun, as well as white light observations that revealed specific features of the solar corona at different distances from the sun. These observations confirm long-standing predictions concerning areas of rapid stellar gas dynamics near the sun. These discoveries are important for improving our understanding of the space environment close to the sun and of the interactions between interplanetary dust and celestial objects in our solar system. They also provide valuable information on the early stages of solar system formation. The Parker probe has captured images of solar flares in unprecedented detail. These images will enable scientists to better understand the formation of solar flares and their impact on our planet. Solar flares, which are powerful explosions of solar energy, can have significant impacts on Earth, including disrupting satellite communications and causing power outages. In addition, the Parker Solar Probe has observed numerous solar storms triggered by the release of energy from the Sun. By closely examining these solar storms, scientists can better understand their formation and impact on our planet. This information is essential for developing better space weather forecasting capabilities. Mercury, like Uranus and Neptune, is one of the least explored planets due to the difficulty of reaching it. Its proximity to the Sun and extreme environmental conditions make Mercury a fascinating object of study. Its unique features, such as its orbital and rotational dynamics and its geological history, offer valuable insights into the mechanisms influencing our solar system. This planet, the closest to the Sun, has proved to be a place of contradictions, a world of extremes, a dynamic planet that holds more surprises than scientists had initially attributed to it. Its ancient cratered surface has not been disturbed by recent geological activity. However, the planet has a magnetic field caused by a molten core, which is expected to cause changes on the surface. Close to the sun, Mercury experiences surface temperatures of up to 430 degrees Celsius. However, as with our moon, water ice exists inside permanently shaded craters at the poles. Scientists are interested in understanding Mercury in order to deepen their knowledge of planetary formation and the conditions of the early solar system. Mercury is of particular interest to scientists studying exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. Thousands of known exoplanets orbit very close to their stars. By studying Mercury in our own solar system, we can better understand what these closely orbiting worlds might look like. Nevertheless, this study presents a particular challenge as it takes more energy to send a spacecraft there than to reach Pluto. Mercury, with the fastest orbit in the solar system, orbits the Sun at a speed of 48 kilometers per second. Missions aiming to enter orbit around Mercury generally use flybys of Earth, Venus, and or Mercury itself to benefit from gravitational nudges adjusting their trajectories. Only two spacecraft have visited Mercury, and a third is on the way. In the 1970s, NASA's Mariner 10 made three flybys, each time observing the same side of the planet, revealing its cratered surface and magnetic field. No other spacecraft visited Mercury until NASA's Messenger became the first to orbit the planet in 2011. 
This probe provided a more complete picture of Mercury than ever before. It revealed that the planet had an exceptionally large core and an offset magnetic field. Messenger also discovered that Mercury was rich in volatiles, elements that evaporate at room temperature, including finding abundant evidence of water ice at the poles. These discoveries have helped to rule out many previous formation models and deepen our knowledge of the formation and evolution of the solar system. We also study Mercury with powerful Earth-based radar telescopes, which send energy towards the planet and measure reflections. The radio telescope at the Arecibo Observatory on the island of Puerto Rico has mapped water ice inside Mercury's shaded craters. The only current mission to Mercury is Bepi Colombo, a joint Japanese-European mission launched in 2018 and due to reach Mercury orbit in 2025. Bepi Colombo will help us understand why Mercury has such a large core and how the planet generates its magnetic field. It will also enable planetary scientists to better understand why some planets like Mercury and Earth generate internal magnetic fields while others like Venus and Mars do not. Recently, it has been reported in new research based on earlier observations by the messenger probe that the smallest planet in our solar system is getting smaller and smaller as heat escapes from its core and new cracks open up on its surface. For millennia, the planet Mercury has been cooling and contracting, forming huge scars on its surface known as lobate escarpments while its rocky crust is deforming as a result of this shrinkage. Geologists were uncertain as to the formation of the escarpments and whether Mercury would create new ones as it cooled. However, a recent study took a close look at these rock formations. The researchers discovered small cracks suggesting that the escarpments have undergone movement over the past 300 million years. This is similar to the wrinkles that appear on an apple as it ages, but in this case the apple shrinks instead of wrinkles as it dries out. The research team identified grabens, which are small cracks parallel to a fault line near the low beta escarpments. Grabens are formed from fault lines by attempting to bend a rigid section of rock. If you tried to bend a piece of toast, it might crack in the same way. In all, the team identified 48 confirmed Grabens and 244 other potentially Graben features. Movements of the escarpments can cause Grabens and tremors called Mercury tremors, similar to the moon tremors measured on the moon. Another major discovery revealed evidence suggesting the potential for life on Mercury, particularly at its North Pole. Using images from the messenger probe, researchers have identified features that appear to be salt glaciers in Mercury's Raditlati and Emeniscu craters. Unlike terrestrial glaciers, these would be made up of saline compounds trapping volatile substances such as water, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. The formation of these glaciers is attributed to the impact of space rocks on Mercury's surface which penetrated the outer basaltic layer and released compounds rich in volatile substances beneath the surface. Mercury's extreme temperatures, which can reach 430 degrees Celsius or 806 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, have since caused these compounds to evaporate. However, the remnants of these glaciers are still identifiable thanks to geological features similar to those on Earth. Mercurian glaciers, distinct from those on Earth, originate from deeply buried volatile rich layers exposed by asteroid impacts. Researchers estimate that these glaciers, formed by saline flows, have retained volatile substances for over a billion years. This discovery has led to the theory that Mercury's subterranean zones, protected from the Sun's intense heat, 
could harbor conditions favorable to extreme forms of life. On Earth, certain saline compounds create habitable niches even in very hostile environments, such as the Atacama Desert in Chile. This suggests that subterranean zones on Mercury could be more habitable than its rough surface. These areas could potentially act as depth-dependent Goldilocks zones, analogous to regions around a star where liquid water might exist, but in this case the emphasis is on the depth beneath the planet's surface rather than the distance to a star. The research challenges the idea that Mercury is a planet devoid of volatiles, suggesting instead the existence of volatile rich layers beneath its surface. A central mystery is to understand the formation of Mercury's glaciers and chaotic terrains. To this end, researchers have examined the Aurora Borealis, located in Mercury's northern polar region. This area is marked by complex disintegration patterns, having erased entire populations of craters dating back some 4 billion years. Beneath this collapsed layer lies an older cratered paleosurface, revealed by gravimetric studies. The juxtaposition of fragmented crust on this ancient surface suggests that the volatile rich layers were deposited on an already solidified landscape. These findings challenge prevailing theories on the formation of volatile rich layers, traditionally centered on mantle differentiation processes. The evidence suggests a large-scale structure possibly resulting from the collapse of a hot, ephemeral, primordial atmosphere early in Mercury's history. This collapse could have occurred mainly during long periods of night, when the planet's surface was not exposed to the sun's intense heat. The information was obtained through the use of sophisticated models and detailed analysis of observational data. This represents a significant advance in our understanding of Mercury's geological history and its potential to host life. The discovery of Mercury's glaciers broadens our understanding of the environmental conditions that could support life, adding an essential dimension to our exploration of astrobiology and the study of the potential habitability of Mercury-like exoplanets. Current and future missions to Mercury should reveal even more secrets about this mysterious planet, helping to improve our understanding of the universe. Venus has attracted a great deal of interest due to fascinating features such as its atmospheric density, which is 95 times greater than that of the Earth. Due to its slow rotation on its axis, Venus's atmosphere, heated by the Sun, is subject to super-rotation, resulting in eternal and extremely powerful winds that blow constantly and unidirectionally. Our neighboring planet's cloudy skies made it a mystery until technological advances enabled humankind to unlock its secrets. The similarities in size and planetary composition between Venus and Earth make them sister planets. Although Venus is actively evolving like Earth, the two planets are very different in appearance. While Earth is abundant with life, Venus, our neighbor, appears inhospitable. This contrast makes the planet particularly fascinating for scientists. A discovery in favor of the possibility of life on Venus has been announced by a team of researchers who found that amino acids remain stable in highly concentrated sulfuric acid. This suggests that they could remain stable in the neighboring planet's highly sulfuric clouds. If life forms exist in the toxic clouds of Venus, they are unlikely to lack amino acids, an essential component of life. Although Venus is considered Earth's twin, it is far less habitable. The planet is scorching hot, with temperatures exceeding 460 degrees Celsius, or 
860 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than mercury, and enveloped by clouds of sulfuric acid, a colorless liquid capable of dissolving metals. As a result, Venus is not considered an ideal habitat for living organisms, especially when compared with Mars, Jupiter's moon Europa, or Saturn's moon Enceladus. However, scientists believe that if life does exist in this extreme environment, it could survive in Venus's noxious clouds, which are colder than the planet's surface, and could therefore be home to some extreme forms of life. In this context, a new experiment conducted by researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology has revealed that 19 amino acids can survive for at least a month in a solution of sulfuric acid with a little water, a condition similar to that found in the clouds of Venus. The results show that sulfuric acid is not always hostile to terrestrial organic chemistry and suggest that the planet's clouds could contain some of these complex molecules necessary for life. While this does not necessarily imply the presence of life, it does open up the possibility that Venusian clouds could harbor complex chemicals essential to life. Early last year, researchers dissolved 20 amino acids, which are essential molecules for all forms of life on Earth, in vials of sulfuric acid mixed with water to simulate the Venusian cloud environment. Over four weeks, the team analyzed the structure of these amino acids, including glycine, histidine, and arginine, and found that the molecular skeleton of 19 of them remained intact, despite the acidic environment. However, showing that this molecular structure is stable in sulfuric acid does not prove the existence of life on Venus. Had this structure been compromised, it would have ruled out the possibility of life as we know it. Nine of the 20 amino acids tested are also found in meteorites, suggesting that meteor impacts may have brought these molecules to Venus. The search for such molecules in the thick clouds of the neighboring planet is the objective of a private mission scheduled for late 2024 called Venus Life Finder this mission will send a spacecraft named Photon to fly over Venus and send a small instrumental probe into the planet's atmosphere. This parachuteless probe is designed to detect organic compounds as it falls, then send radio data back to Earth before being destroyed, helping to assess Venus's habitability potential. In addition, for the first time, researchers have discovered oxygen atoms on both the day and night sides of Venus's atmosphere. The planet's atmosphere is corrosive and hot enough to melt lead, and its toxic clouds are dangerous for humans. Sometimes it even rains acid. However, researchers have recently discovered that between the layers of toxic gases, this uninhabitable atmosphere contains a thin layer of molecular oxygen. A team of German astrophysicists examined data from NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, focusing on 17 positions in Venus's atmosphere, both on the day and night side. They detected molecular oxygen a gas composed of unbound oxygen atoms in each of these positions. This does not mean, however, that astronauts could breathe oxygen on Venus as they would on Earth. Molecular oxygen is different from breathable oxygen, whereas the oxygen we breathe on Earth is made up of two oxygen atoms linked to form the O2 molecule, molecular oxygen is a soup of single floating oxygen atoms. If we tried to breathe it in, it would react too easily with our lung tissue and not reach our bloodstream. Although oxygen has already been observed on the nocturnal side of Venus, this is the first time researchers have detected it in daylit regions too. Researchers believe that molecular oxygen accumulates as the sun's heat breaks down carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide molecules. 
Winds in the atmosphere then carry these oxygen atoms to the planet's night side, where they gradually react with other elements. The molecular oxygen layer probably also has a slight cooling effect on the upper layer of Venus's atmosphere. This modest cooling is not enough to counter the planet's uncontrollable greenhouse effect, but it does suggest a milder, more pleasant past for Venus. This planet has a very long plasma tail that has long attracted the attention of researchers. During the missions of the Parker Solar Probe, this unique feature of Venus was fully exploited to circumvent an important point during its travels around the Sun. As a result, the probe was able to collect groundbreaking data on Venus, opening up new perspectives on our understanding of this mysterious planet. Scientists were able to observe the ring of dust surrounding Venus, measure the radio waves present in its atmosphere, and deepen their understanding of the planet's geology and mineralogy. One of the most striking discoveries was the immense size of the comet-shaped plasma tail that follows Venus, a surprising revelation compared to the size of the planet itself. What's more, the Parker probe made history by capturing the very first images of Venus's surface in visible wavelengths. These never-before-seen images offer a glimpse of what we might observe if humans were close enough to Venus. This could lead to even more discoveries in the near future, helping to enrich our understanding of this fascinating planet. The fourth planet from the Sun, Mars, has always aroused keen scientific and popular interest. Once scarred by ancient cataclysms that rendered it barren, Mars continues to reveal scientific clues, suggesting that it may have harbored life. For decades, robots have been exploring its surface, revealing images of a world of strange and breathtaking beauty. The mystery of the origins of life on Earth has long puzzled scientists, but a recent discovery on Mars could shed new light on this profound question, bringing the discovery of Martian life one step closer. NASA's Curiosity rover has uncovered a set of well-preserved ancient mud cracks, forming a distinctive hexagonal pattern, indicating the presence of wet, dry cycles in Mars' early history. These cycles may have been important for the assembly of the complex chemical components required for microbial life. Scientists confirm that these mud cracks form when wet and dry conditions occur repeatedly, perhaps seasonally. Exploration of Mount Sharp, which rises 5.5 kilometers or 3.4 miles high in Gale Crater, has led to this groundbreaking discovery. In 2021, after drilling a sample of rock called Pontours, located in the transition zone between a clay-rich layer and a layer enriched in saline minerals called sulfates, the rover spotted these cracks. This transition zone in the history of Gale Crater has provided scientists with valuable information about the Martian past. It represents a time when long periods of drought prevailed and the lakes and rivers that once filled the crater began to recede. As the mud dries, it shrinks and fractures into T-shaped junctions. However, persistent exposure to water allowed the junctions to soften and take on a Y-shape, forming a fascinating hexagonal pattern. The continued formation of these hexagonal cracks even as new sediments were deposited, indicates that wet and dry conditions persisted over long periods. Curiosity's precision laser instrument also confirmed the presence of a resistant sulfate crust along the edges of the fissures, preserving them for billions of years. According to the scientists, this is the first evidence that Mars' ancient climate exhibited wet-dry cycles as regular as those on Earth. More importantly, these cycles are useful 
perhaps even necessary, for the molecular evolution that could lead to life. The conditions for life are complex. If water is vital, balance is necessary. The right balance can promote the chemical reactions essential to life by controlling the concentration of chemicals that fuel the formation of polymers like nucleic acids, considered the building blocks of life. The Pontour's mud cracks represent much more than just an intriguing geological discovery. They offer the first opportunity to study environmental remnants that may have given rise to life. Unlike Earth, where tectonic plates continually reshape and bury its surface, Mars' lack of tectonic activity has preserved much earlier periods of the planet's history. Another discovery suggests that a group of rocks scattered on an ancient shoreline of Mars could indicate that the red planet once looked much more like Earth than scientists previously thought. Indeed, the rocks discovered by the Curiosity rover are exceptionally rich in manganese oxide. It's a chemical element that reinforces the growing evidence that Mars, once habitable, may have experienced Earth-like levels of oxygen, as well as conditions conducive to early life, according to researchers. Scientists consider manganese on Earth to be an unsung hero of the evolution of life. They know that manganese was abundant in rocks and oceans before the first forms of life appeared, some four billion years ago, and that it played an important role in the production of the oxygen needed for life today. The only known ways of producing manganese oxide involve either an abundance of oxygen or microbial activity. However, there is no solid evidence of oxygen on Mars, nor any evidence of microbial life, which leaves scientists puzzled about the formation of this oxide in recently discovered rocks. The formation of manganese oxide-rich rocks is common on Earth, thanks to microbes and the oxygen they produce, suggesting a possible connection with life. The Curiosity rover found manganese in heavily eroded rocks during its exploration of Gale Crater an ancient lake 155 kilometers in diameter since 2012. At the discovery site, the rover recorded an elevation change of 10 to 15 meters. The texture of the rocks from curved to flat indicates a river channel flowing into a lake. If this hypothesis is correct, the rocks could have been deposited when the river water slowed as it entered the lake rocks similar to those rich in manganese oxide found on the shores of shallow lakes on Earth. These newly discovered rocks provide further evidence of the past presence of liquid water on Mars, reinforcing the hypothesis of its habitability. In addition, water in the form of gel has been spotted for the first time at the equator of Mars. Previously, it was thought that freezing was impossible in this equatorial region of the Red Planet, similar to its tropics. This discovery could be essential for modeling the distribution of water on Mars and understanding exchanges between its atmosphere and surface, a vital aspect for future manned missions. The frost was observed by two European Space Agency probes, the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, which arrived in 2016, and Mars Express, which has been orbiting Mars since 2003. The frost lies in the Tharsis region, the largest volcanic area on Mars, home to 12 major volcanoes, including Olympus Mons, the highest peak in the solar system, with an altitude of 22.5 kilometers, or 14 miles, around 2.5 times the height of Mount Everest. Scientists believe that frost could not form around Mars' equator due to the combination of sunshine and thin atmosphere, maintaining relatively high surface and mountaintop temperatures. 
This contrasts with Earth, where icy summits are common. Moreover, it suggests exceptional frost-forming processes. The icy patches appear only a few hours around sunrise before evaporating in the sunlight. They are extremely thin, with a thickness comparable to that of a human hair, but cover a vast area on each volcano, their water content able to fill around 60 Olympic-sized swimming pools. The water is constantly exchanged between the surface and the atmosphere of Mars during each Martian day, which lasts around 24 and a half hours during the cold season. The Tharsis region, with its immense volcanoes, dominates the surrounding equatorial plains. Frost has been spotted on the Tharsis, Olympic Mons, Arsha Mons, Ascreus Mons, and Serranius Tholus volcanoes. Each of these volcanoes has deep troughs called calderas, formed by magma chambers during eruptions. Scientists believe that the unique air circulation above Tharsis creates a microclimate with calderas having specific climatic conditions, enabling the formation of frost patches. Winds climb the mountain slopes carrying moist air from the surface to higher altitudes where it condenses into frost. The frost observed seems to form in the shaded areas of calderas, particularly where temperatures are colder. The discovery of water on the surface of Mars is always exciting for its scientific implications and for human and robotic exploration. Mars' low atmospheric pressure creates an unusual situation, where mountaintops are generally no colder than plains. However, this research shows that moist air on mountain slopes can still condense into frost. Understanding the similarities and differences between terrestrial and Martian phenomena enhances our understanding of fundamental processes occurring not only on Earth but elsewhere in the cosmos. Scientists recently announced new evidence of the presence of organic matter on Mars, which could indicate past life on the planet. NASA's Perseverance rover discovered this organic material. Since landing in February 2021, it has been collecting data on Mars, with the mission of searching for signs of ancient life by collecting soil and rock samples. These samples will be recovered on future missions and returned to Earth for further analysis. The researchers revealed that the latest discoveries show carbon signals similar to those associated with living organisms on Earth. The presence of carbon could indicate ancient biological life on Mars, although this material could also come from non-biological processes. Previously, NASA explorers, the Phoenix Lander and Curiosity rover, had found evidence of organic carbon on Mars using gas-based methods. However, the latest discoveries were made with a different method, using an instrument attached to Perseverance's robotic arm. This instrument, equipped with cameras, spectrometers, and a laser, searches for organic matter and minerals, focusing on materials potentially modified by aqueous environments, likely to contain biological evidence of past life. This new research method has revealed a more complex organic geochemical cycle on Mars than previously thought. This has implications for our understanding of the Martian carbon cycle and the possibility that the planet once harbored life. The instrument proved highly effective in mapping the positions of organic molecules and minerals on the rocky surfaces around the Jezero crater. Scientists believe that this crater contains the remains of an ancient river system, making this region a prime location for the search for signs of past life. They estimate that if life had existed on Mars, it would have been present three to four billion years ago 
at a time when water flowed abundantly on the planet. These recent discoveries represent significant progress in the search for signs of ancient life on Mars. We are fortunate to have a planet like Mars nearby, which still retains the memory of the natural processes that can lead to life. This discovery is a convincing reminder that the red planet still holds secrets that could reveal some of the greatest mysteries of life itself. With mountains some three times higher than Everest and canyons up to nine times longer than the Grand Canyon, Mars is a paradise for the adventurers of the future. Similar in some respects to Earth, with its dusty atmosphere, seasonally changing polar caps and 24-hour days, Mars continues to fuel the human imagination. New discoveries reinforce the importance of continued exploration and study of our neighboring planet. Jupiter is the second largest object in the solar system after the Sun. At its closest point to Earth, it lies just under four astronomical units away. Numerous probes have been sent to study this gas giant's tumultuous atmosphere more closely. However, in different ways, we've just spotted features never before seen in Jupiter's storm clouds. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has discovered a new, never-before-seen feature in Jupiter's atmosphere. It is a high-speed jet stream stretching over 4,800 kilometers or 3,000 miles wide, located above the planet's equator just above the main clouds. This discovery offers valuable insight into the interaction between the different layers of Jupiter's turbulent atmosphere and demonstrates Webb's uniqueness in tracking these phenomena. High-speed jet streams are a common feature in the atmospheres of many planets. On Earth, they form at different latitudes, meander around the planet, change latitude and can reach speeds close to 400 kilometers per hour or 250 miles per hour at altitudes of over 10 kilometers or 6 miles. On gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, jet streams are a major feature of the atmosphere, perfectly aligned with the parallels and known as zonal jets. On Jupiter, these jets alternate direction according to latitude, reaching speeds of around 500 kilometers per hour, or 310 miles per hour. Although Jupiter, a gas giant, is very different from Earth, a rocky temperate planet, both have overlapping atmospheres. The various wavelengths of light observed by Webb and other missions reveal the lower layers of Jupiter's atmosphere, home to gigantic storms and clouds of ammonia ice. The newly discovered jet moves at around 515 kilometers per hour, or 320 miles per hour, twice as fast as the sustained winds of a Category 5 hurricane on Earth. By comparing the winds observed at high altitude by Webb with those in deeper layers measured by the Hubble telescope, the team was able to determine the speed of wind changes with altitude and generate wind shears. Webb's exceptional resolution and wavelength coverage made it possible to detect the small clouds used to track the jet. Hubble's complementary observations made a day after Webb's were crucial in establishing the initial state of Jupiter's equatorial atmosphere and observing the development of convective storms at the equator, independent of the jet. The gas giant exhibits a complex but reproducible pattern of winds and temperatures in its equatorial stratosphere, well above the winds measured in clouds and mists at those wavelengths. If the strength of this new jet is linked to this oscillating pattern of the stratosphere, we can expect the jet to vary considerably over the next two to four years, 
an exciting hypothesis to test in the years ahead. By exploring larger regions like Jupiter, we can better understand the fundamental physics of the Earth's magnetosphere and improve our space weather forecasts. Space weather concerns disturbances to the Earth's magnetosphere caused by interactions between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field, often linked to solar storms and coronal mass ejections from the Sun. This can disrupt power grids, pipelines, and communication systems. Researchers at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Institute of Geophysics have discovered that Jupiter's magnetosphere has predominantly closed magnetic field lines at the poles, but with a crescent-shaped region of open field lines. The magnetosphere acts as a shield, deflecting much of the solar wind. The debate over whether the poles should be open or closed has been going on for over 40 years. An open magnetosphere means that the magnetic field lines at the poles are broken by the solar wind and extend out into space. This allows the solar wind to interact directly with Jupiter's ionosphere and atmosphere, without causing auroras but transferring energy and momentum to the closed system. The Earth's magnetosphere is wide open at its poles, allowing auroras to appear on closed field lines. Energy present on open field lines can disrupt power grids and communications. The researchers use data from NASA's Juno probe, orbiting Jupiter since 2016, to study its magnetosphere. In 2021, Models suggested two regions of open field lines at Jupiter's poles, supported by recent Juno data. The new findings show a polar zone where ions flow in the opposite direction to Jupiter's rotation. Modeling indicates a similar ion flow near the open field lines proposed in 2021. The ionized gas on the closed field lines rotates with Jupiter, while that on the open lines follows the solar wind. These discoveries on Jupiter and Earth at opposite ends of the spectrum of open and closed field lines are key to understanding magnetospheric physics. The characteristics of rotating giant magnetospheres like Jupiter's will be essential for future explorations. Perhaps the most magnificent object in our solar system, Saturn, the sixth planet from the Sun, fascinates scientists with its unique energy dynamics. This gigantic gas planet is surrounded by spectacular rings of dust and ice, probably formed by the destruction of an icy satellite. Unlike the Earth, Saturn emits more energy than it receives from the Sun. This excess energy comes from the planet's internal heat, generated by the slow gravitational compression of its core, and possibly by helium precipitation. Saturn's seasonal variations considerably affect its energy balance. Its high orbital eccentricity, which modifies its distance from the Sun, leads to fluctuating absorption of solar energy. In addition, Saturn's inclination in long seasons, each lasting more than seven Earth years, contribute to these energy variations. The Cassini mission has provided valuable data, revealing how these factors influence Saturn's weather, including its storms and symbolic bands. A recent discovery has revealed a massive energy imbalance on Saturn offering new insights into planetary science and evolution. This revelation challenges existing climate models for the solar system's gas giants. Using data from the Cassini mission, researchers at the University of Houston have identified a significant and previously unknown seasonal energy imbalance on Saturn. This is the first time that a global energy imbalance on a seasonal scale has been observed on a gas giant. This not only gives us new insight into the formation and evolution of planets, 
but also changes the way we think about planetary and atmospheric science. Saturn's energy imbalance is mainly due to its high orbital eccentricity, which varies by almost 20% between aphelion, the point furthest from the Sun, and perihelion, the point closest to the Sun. This results in significant seasonal variations in absorbed solar energy. Unlike the Earth, which has a negligible internal heat contribution in short seasons, Saturn's internal heat significantly affects its thermal structure and climate. Every planet receives energy from the Sun in the form of solar radiation and loses energy by emitting thermal radiation. But Saturn, like other gas giants, has another source of energy in the form of deep internal heat affecting its thermal structure and climate. The data suggests that Saturn's unbalanced energy balance plays a key role in the development of the giant storms that dominate the planet's atmospheric system. This discovery could also provide insight into Earth's weather systems. The discovery of Saturn's seasonal energy imbalance requires a reevaluation of current models and theories concerning the atmosphere, climate, and evolution of gas giants. This research not only improves our understanding of Saturn, but also provides a basis for future exploration and study of other planets in our solar system. NASA has discovered new evidence that Saturn's moon, Enceladus, contains materials essential for the development of life. The evidence comes from observations by the Cassini probe, which has spent seven years observing seasonal changes around Saturn and collecting data on its moons. Two of the probe's major discoveries concern the moons, Titan and Enceladus. During its observations of Titan, Cassini studied climatic activity and recorded data on its rivers, lakes, and oceans, finding many Earth-like features that could harbor life. For Enceladus, the probe detected hydrogen molecules in ice and vapor particles thrown up from the Moon's surface. Announced in 2017, this discovery suggests deep water chemical reactions between water and rock, potentially favorable to microbial life. Recently, NASA shared a new discovery reinforcing earlier findings. Scientists have identified strong evidence for the presence of hydrogen cyanide, an essential molecule for life, in the streams of ice and water vapor from Enceladus observed by Cassini. The data were collected by an instrument on the probe that measures the activity of gases, ions, and ice particles around Saturn. The discovery of hydrogen cyanide is particularly exciting, as this molecule is fundamental to theories on the origin of life. NASA explained that for life to exist in space, there must be basic building blocks such as amino acids, of which hydrogen cyanide is a crucial precursor. The researchers also found evidence to suggest that Enceladus's underground ocean contains a powerful source of chemical energy in the form of several organic compounds. These compounds, similar to those used by terrestrial organisms, increase the likelihood that life can form and survive on Enceladus. In addition to meeting basic habitability requirements, Enceladus appears to offer conditions conducive to the formation of complex biomolecules. The search for possible life on Titan will continue with NASA's Dragonfly Exploratory Mission, scheduled for 2028. This drone is designed to capture images and land on Titan to collect data. On a clear night with a decent amateur telescope, Saturn and its magnificent rings can be observed from Earth. New supercomputer simulations have offered an answer to the mystery of the ring's origins, suggesting a massive collision in the age of the dinosaurs. According to recent research carried out by NASA and its partners, Saturn's rings could have originated from the debris of two icy moons that collided 
and shattered a few hundred million years ago. The remaining debris could also have contributed to the formation of some of Saturn's current moons. NASA's Cassini mission determined that Saturn's rings and some of its moons are relatively young from an astronomical point of view, opening up new questions about their formation. To investigate this question further, a team of researchers modeled various possible collisions between precursor moons, using a resolution more than 100 times greater than previous studies. These simulations have provided the best information to date on the history of the Saturn system. Saturn's rings now lie close to the planet in the Roche limit, the furthest orbit where the planet's gravity can disintegrate larger bodies of rock or ice as they approach. Material orbiting beyond this limit could clump together to form moons. By simulating nearly 200 different collision scenarios, the team found that many of them could disperse enough ice into the Roche limit where it could condense into rings. Contrary to other theories, this explanation could also justify why Saturn's rings are made almost entirely of ice with very little rock. When icy moons collide, the surface ice is more dispersed than the rock in the cores. The ice and rocky debris could have collided with other moons in the system, triggering a cascade of collisions and potentially disrupting other precursor moons, from which the current moons could have been formed. But what triggered these events? Gravitational effects from the Sun, gradually building up, could have destabilized the orbits of two of Saturn's ancient moons, pushing them towards collision. In certain orbital configurations, the Sun's additional attraction can create a resonance that elongates and tilts the orbits, leading to a high-speed impact. Saturn's moon Rhea now orbits just beyond this resonance. As moons migrate outwards over time, if Rhea were ancient, it would have crossed this resonance recently. However, its circular flat orbit suggests that it did not, indicating a more recent formation. This new research confirms the idea that Saturn's rings formed recently, although many questions remain. Future research based on this work will enable us to learn more about this fascinating planet and the icy worlds that surround it. The twin planets Uranus and Neptune have not been explored since the Voyager flybys 30 years ago. The reason why no spacecraft has been sent to them is essentially psychological and political. Scientists have an implicit rule. They want to be able to analyze the data collected by the space probes they send before ending their professional careers. Because of the complexity and considerable time required to organize a mission to these distant planets, as well as the presence of objects more accessible to scientists close to Earth, these projects receive more dynamic financial support. The ice giants Uranus and Neptune are extraordinary planets in our solar system, as their magnetic fields are not aligned with their axes of rotation. Although scientists still have no definitive explanation for this phenomenon, clues may be found in the Aurora Borealis of Uranus. After more than 30 years, scientists have finally confirmed that the icy planet Uranus has an infrared aurora. This discovery will help us better understand the behavior of magnetic fields on ice giants like Uranus and Neptune. It could even help astronomers use NASA's James Webb Space Telescope to identify similar auroras on exoplanets. Auroras are caused by highly energetic charged particles that are channeled into a planet's atmosphere via its magnetic field lines. On Earth, this gives rise to the famous Aurora Borealis and Aurora Australis. On planets like Uranus, where the atmosphere is mainly composed of hydrogen and helium, these aurorae emit light in the infrared spectrum, invisible to the naked eye. 
Although Uranus's ultraviolet aurorae have been observed since 1986, no infrared aurora had been confirmed until now. Using data collected in 2006 with the Keck 2 telescope, researchers studied infrared auroral measurements by analyzing specific wavelengths of light emitted by Uranus. This method enabled them to analyze the planet's light, known as the emission line, similar to a barcode. In the infrared spectrum, the lines emitted by a charged particle, known as the trihydrogen cation, H3+, vary in brightness according to the temperature and density of the atmosphere, acting like a thermometer. Observations revealed a clear increase in trihydrogen density in Uranus's atmosphere, with little change in temperature, consistent with ionization caused by the presence of an infrared aurora. This discovery not only helps to better understand the magnetic fields of planets outside our solar system, but could also help identify other planets suitable for life. The temperature of gas giant planets, including Uranus and Neptune, is several hundred degrees Celsius above the predictions of models based solely on solar heating, raising the question of their heat source. One theory suggests that auroral energy could be generating and moving heat towards the magnetic equator. The majority of exoplanets discovered so far belong to the sub-Neptune category, similar in size to Neptune and Uranus, which could indicate similar magnetic and atmospheric characteristics. By analyzing the aurora borealis of Uranus directly linked to its magnetic field and atmosphere, we can predict the atmospheres and magnetic fields of these worlds, and therefore, their potential habitability. These discoveries could also shed light on the phenomenon of geomagnetic inversion on Earth, where the magnetic poles change hemisphere. This process occurs daily on Uranus due to its unique misalignment of rotational and magnetic axes. The ongoing study of Uranus's aurora will provide data on what to expect during a pole reversal on Earth and its implications for its magnetic field, satellites, communications, and navigation. Astronomers from the International Astronomical Union have also discovered three new moons around the most distant planets in our solar system, two orbiting Neptune and one around Uranus. Neptune's two moons were first observed in September 2021. The brighter one measures around 23 kilometers, or 15 miles, and takes almost nine years to orbit Neptune, while the fainter one takes around 27 years, the longest known orbital journey for a moon. Uranus's new moon was discovered in November 2023. It measures around 8 kilometers or 5 miles in diameter and takes 680 days to circle the planet. These moons were spotted using powerful ground-based telescopes in various locations around the world. Neptune's brightest moon was discovered using the Magellan Telescope in Chile, while Neptune's faintest moon was found using the Subaru Telescope in Hawaii. Long exposure photographs taken over several nights enabled us to observe the surroundings of Uranus and Neptune in greater detail. Special image processing was required to reveal these faint objects. Thanks to these discoveries, Uranus now has 28 known moons and Neptune 16. The three newly discovered moons are the faintest ever observed around these two giant planets using ground-based telescopes. Astronomers hope that these discoveries will lead to a better understanding of the formation of these moons, the early years of the solar system, and the movement of planets at its outer edges. Astronomers believe that these new moons were captured by the gravity of Uranus and Neptune shortly after their formation. The discovery of the moon around Uranus is the first of its kind in over 20 years. It will probably be named after a Shakespearean character 
following the tradition of other Uranus moons. The search for other small moons continues as astronomers suspect there are many more out there. Pluto is a celestial body located in the Kuiper Belt beyond Neptune. Contrary to popular belief, Pluto is actually icy rather than rocky. Its average temperature is around minus 233 degrees Celsius, or minus 387 degrees Fahrenheit, making it an extremely cold place in our solar system. Its atmosphere, composed mainly of dinitrogen, with some methane and carbon monoxide, helps maintain this icy temperature. New research on a crater discovered by NASA's New Horizons probe suggests that a massive volcano on Pluto, similar in size to the one in Yellowstone National Park, could have erupted and released icy material onto the dwarf planet's surface a few million years ago. Scientists have discovered a supervolcano near Sputnik, Planitia, a bright heart-shaped region on Pluto. They estimate that this volcano probably erupted only a few million years ago. This may seem a long time ago, but it's relatively recent on a cosmic scale, since the solar system is over 4.5 billion years old. Unlike terrestrial volcanoes, which eject molten rock, the Kilads crater, 44 kilometers or 27 miles in diameter, appears to have spewed icy lava onto Pluto's surface in a process known as cryovolcanism. This process, also observed on the moons of our solar system's gas giants, would have propelled water from Pluto's underground ocean towards its surface, reshaping the landscape over millions of years. This phenomenon has been observed throughout the outer solar system, notably on certain moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. As with terrestrial volcanism, a heat source melts mantle material, which can then escape to the surface. Although we're used to seeing rocky lava, ice and water can also act as lava under the right conditions. For the first time, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide ices have been observed at the farthest reaches of our solar system on trans-Neptunian objects. A research team made these discoveries by using the infrared spectral capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope to analyze the chemical composition of 59 trans-Neptunian objects. The study suggests that carbon dioxide ice was abundant in the cold outer regions of the protoplanetary disk, the vast rotating disk of gas and dust from which the solar system formed. Further research is needed to understand the origins of carbon monoxide ice, as it is also prevalent on the trans-Neptunian object studied. The researchers detected carbon dioxide in 56 trans-Neptunian objects, and carbon monoxide in 28 out of a sample of 59 objects observed with the Webb telescope. Carbon dioxide was widespread across the surface of the trans-Neptunian population, regardless of dynamical class and body size, while carbon monoxide was only detected in objects with a high abundance of carbon dioxide, according to the study. The discovery of these ices may help us understand the formation of our solar system and the migration of celestial objects. Trans-Neptunian objects are remnants of the planetary formation process. These discoveries can place important constraints on where these objects formed, how they reached their current region, and how their surfaces have evolved since their formation. As they formed at great distances from the Sun and are smaller than planets, they contain untouched information about the original composition of the protoplanetary disk. Trans-Neptunian objects, often dubbed the fossils of our solar system, have long intrigued scientists. These icy bodies spared the heat of the Sun, 
hold clues to the conditions that prevailed in the early days of the solar system. The discovery of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide ice adds another dimension to this cosmic puzzle. The widespread presence of carbon dioxide ice suggests that it was abundant in the outer regions of the protoplanetary disk. However, the origin of carbon monoxide ice remains a mystery. While the carbon dioxide was probably accumulated from the protoplanetary disk, the origin of the carbon monoxide is more uncertain. Future observations with the Webb telescope and other telescopes will help to answer the many questions raised by this discovery. This space telescope, with its unrivaled capabilities, will revolutionize our understanding of the cosmos. The discovery of ancient ice on trans-Neptunian objects is just the beginning of a new era of astronomical exploration. The quest for the mysterious ninth planet continues. New research has provided convincing statistical evidence for the existence of such a planet orbiting in the solar system, well beyond the orbit of Neptune. Previously, numerous studies had been conducted to find evidence of this hypothetical planet. In a recent study, a team of researchers tracked the motion of trans-Neptunian objects such as Pluto and Eris. They analyzed objects previously ignored due to their unstable motion, caused by Neptune's gravity, which made it difficult to interpret their trajectories. However, the researchers decided not to give up. The data collected was used in simulations comparing the known gravitational forces of other planets, stars, and galactic flows from the Milky Way. Two sets of simulations were carried out, one assuming the existence of the ninth planet, the other not. The motion of these trans-Neptunian objects would be improbable if the ninth planet did not exist. However, according to the latest data, the presence of this planet is more consistent with current observations of space. According to calculations, this planet, corresponding to the characteristics of the ninth, would have a mass five times greater than that of the Earth, and would be located at a distance of 500 astronomical units from the Sun. This means it would be very difficult to observe, but simulations can help reveal its presence and location. However, the evidence for the existence of the ninth planet remains insufficient. Attempts to detect it by studying its effect on other solar system objects have failed. But thanks to powerful telescopes, in particular the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile, researchers are hoping to solve this mystery. They look forward to the results of future studies to test their hypotheses, Future explorations of our solar system promise even more surprising discoveries and new perspectives for our knowledge of the universe. But what exactly are superhabitable planets? How are they defined? How do they differ from Earth? And what are their specific characteristics? Let's explore the concept of superhabitable worlds so you can better understand why some astrophysicists are convinced that Earth isn't necessarily the most habitable planet in the universe. Superhabitable planets are planets or moons with conditions that are even more conducive to the emergence and evolution of life than Earth. Of course, such planets remain hypothetical, for the time being. In their detailed report, Superhabitable Worlds, published in January 2014 in the journal Astrobiology, the astrophysicists detailed the characteristics of these superhabitable worlds Basically, it's a list of criteria that a planet would have to meet to qualify as a superhabitable world. 
these criteria include, but are not limited to, intrinsic criteria linked to the planet's characteristics. To qualify as a superhabitable planet, an exoplanet must first orbit a star of spectral type K, known as an orange dwarf. By comparison, the Sun is a G or yellow dwarf star. The most common stars in the universe are red dwarfs of spectral type M. Orange dwarfs are of great interest in the search for extraterrestrial life, as their stability time on the main sequence is longer than that of a star like the Sun. In fact, an orange dwarf is stable for 18 to 34 billion years, whereas the Sun is stable for only 10 billion years. Life is therefore more likely to emerge and develop on a planet orbiting an orange dwarf. What's more, orange dwarfs emit less ultraviolet radiation than yellow dwarfs. UV radiation can damage DNA, making it more difficult for life to emerge. What's more, orange dwarfs are thought to be three to five times more abundant than yellow dwarfs like our sun, making it easier to find life around this type of star. For an exoplanet to qualify as a superhabitable world, it must be between 5 and 8 billion years old. That's right, because if an exoplanet is to be home to complex life forms, it has to be old enough for them to have had time to emerge and evolve and become more complex. On Earth, the first multicellular organisms did not appear for several billion years. According to researchers, between 5 and 8 billion years is the optimum time frame for the development of complex life forms before the planet has had time to exhaust its geothermal resources or lose its magnetic field. A superhabitable planet is theorized to be more massive than Earth, up to 1.5 times more massive and at least 10% wider than our planet. A planet with a mass 1.5 times greater than Earth's would be able to retain a significant atmosphere and internal temperature. What's more, the more massive the planet, the more likely it is to have expanses of habitable land, although it is of course possible for extraterrestrial life to develop entirely underwater. We have proof of this in the form of ocean planets which are not superhabitable worlds, but could harbor life. On Earth, moreover, the underwater world is home to a very rich biodiversity, even in places that might seem highly inauspicious, such as the hydrothermal springs on ocean ridges that we mentioned at the start of this journey. Granted, marine biodiversity on our planet represents only 13% of all described living species, but that's because our knowledge of bacteria, microorganisms, and protists, which make up a large part of the underwater living world, particularly at great depths, is still rather limited. In reality, the underwater world hides many species of microorganisms and bacteria that we don't yet know about, and it's very likely that on ocean planets there is also a rich and varied marine ecosystem. Let's return to the criteria that define a superhabitable planet. According to the three researchers behind the study, this type of planet revolves more slowly than the Earth around its star. Its surface temperature would be around 5 degrees Celsius warmer than that of the Earth. A temperature that would be ideal, given that on Earth, tropical climates are conducive to the emergence of a rich biodiversity. In fact, the richness of our planet's flora and fauna increases as we move away from the poles towards the tropics. In tropical forests we find a wide variety of species of all biological types, 
trees, lianas, shrubs, grasses. A planet with a tropical climate, 5 degrees Celsius or 9 degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average than Earth, would therefore be particularly conducive to the emergence of rich biodiversity. Still, according to the astrophysicists behind the publication in the journal Astrobiology, a superhabitable planet would have an atmosphere composed of 25 to 30 percent dioxygen, with the remainder made up of inert gases, i.e. gases that do not take part in any chemical reaction, such as dinitrogen. The presence of clouds and humidity is an indispensable criterion for the emergence of life, and such an atmosphere would offer ideal conditions. Like the Earth, a superhabitable planet would be composed of land and water, distributed in such a way as to include shallow waters and archipelagos. It's possible that superhabitable planets could have a natural satellite with a mass 1 to 10 percent their own. This natural satellite would be neither too close nor too far away at a distance of between 10 and 100 planetary radii. Finally, a superhabitable planet would feature a geological and geochemical recycling mechanism like the Earth and its plate tectonics and would have a fairly strong protective magnetic field. In fact, the superhabitable worlds theorized by this team of astrophysicists would resemble the Earth, only better. They would be older, bigger, warmer, and wetter. For many astrophysicists agree that contrary to what has been thought until now, the Earth does not in fact represent an optimum for planetary habitability. All its characteristics such as the depth of its oceans, the intensity of its magnetic field, its geological activity, and its surface temperature could be even more propitious. There could be planets in the universe that would have allowed life to appear earlier. They would then have more time to develop and evolve. Would searching for superhabitable planets in the universe be more efficient than looking for planets with a high terrestrial similarity index? Yes, according to Rene Heller and John Armstrong, the fathers of the superhabitable world concept. There could be planets that don't resemble the Earth, yet have characteristics that are more conducive to the development of a rich and diverse flora and fauna. However, the similarity index isn't a bad thing. It just needs to be set against other criteria. What Rene Heller and John Armstrong mean is that this concept should not be the only one studied to determine a planet's habitability. For example, the exoplanet TRAPPIST-1d with a similarity index of 0.90 is the known planet with the highest similarity index to Earth. This planet 40 light years away is habitable, but not super habitable. There is indeed a difference between habitable and super habitable. But why? Simply because this planet orbits a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are particularly unstable, with frequent eruptions, and therefore don't offer optimal conditions for the emergence and above all, the long-term development of life. So it's entirely possible that TRAPPIST-1d could be inhabited, but for that to happen, very specific conditions would have to be met at atmospheric level to ensure that any form of life is protected from eruptions and ultraviolet radiation. You'll have understood that the search for planets in the habitable zone which has long been the basis of the search for extraterrestrial life isn't necessarily effective, or at least it's not the only criterion to consider. Just because a planet is located in its star's habitable zone doesn't necessarily mean it's home to life. There are many other criteria to take into account, 
and not all of them are based on Earth. But what are we talking about when we speak of a habitable zone? The habitable zone of a planetary system is the zone around the star where planets could have liquid water if all other conditions were met. In the search for extraterrestrial life, the notion of the habitable zone is very important, because on Earth it is water that makes the emergence of life possible. For a planet in the habitable zone to harbor liquid water, other conditions must be present. Notably, a surface temperature of between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, i.e. between 32 and 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and sufficient mass to retain water and atmosphere. The habitable zone varies from one planetary system to another. Around a red dwarf, a star colder than a yellow and orange dwarfs, the habitable zone is closer to the star. What's more, the older a star gets, the brighter it becomes, and the further away the habitable zone becomes. In our solar system, for example, the habitable zone is between 0.95 and 1.5 astronomical units, one astronomical unit being equivalent to the distance between the Earth and the Sun. However, the search for exoplanets containing water should not be confined to the habitable zone of a star system. A planet may be located slightly outside the habitable zone, but harbor liquid water beneath a frozen surface. In fact, some ocean planets are said to be entirely covered by a liquid ocean under a thin layer of ice. They could be home to amazing underwater creatures like those found in the abysses of our terrestrial oceans. For example, some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, such as Ganymede and Enceladus, are thought to be tidally heated ocean worlds. Be careful not to confuse the stellar habitable zone with the galactic habitable zone. We've just talked about the stellar habitable zone, but the galactic habitable zone is another concept. For life to appear on a planet, it must not only be neither too close nor too far from its star, it must also be close to the center of the galaxy. It's in this zone that there are enough heavy elements to favor the formation of telluric planets and atoms indispensable to life such as iron found in hemoglobin or copper found in hemocyanin, the protein responsible for transporting and storing oxygen in the blood of many invertebrates. On the other hand, the planet shouldn't be too close to the center of the galaxy where it would be exposed to radiation from supernovas, comet and asteroid showers, or the suction of black holes. Indeed, just about every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. The Milky Way, our own galaxy, has one called Sagittarius A, located 27,000 light years from Earth. It is 4 million times more massive than the Sun. Black holes are very powerful, and can suck in dust and gas, as well as stars and planets that get too close. So you see, superhabitable planets can't be too close to the center of the galaxy, or they'll be sucked in at some point in their lives. Determining the galactic habitable zone is a highly complex task. In the Milky Way, our galaxy, this habitable zone would be located 25,000 light years from the galactic center and would extend over 6,000 light years. But this doesn't mean that the galactic habitable zone is the same in other galaxies. In fact, it may not even exist in some galaxies. In any case, the Earth is located both in the galaxy's habitable zone 
and in the habitable zone of the Sun, around which it orbits. Our planet is therefore far from deadly neutron stars, dangerous black holes, and gamma ray bursts, which are very brief but powerful random electromagnetic radiation. If a gamma ray burst were to hit the Earth, the consequences could be disastrous. One of the five mass extinctions of biodiversity, the one that hit the Earth 440 million years ago, could have been caused by this phenomenon. A gamma ray burst could destroy 30% of the ozone layer for almost 10 years, doubling the power of UV rays. Phytoplankton, the basis of the oceanic food chain, would be completely carbonized. But that's not all. Large quantities of nitrogen oxide would form in the atmosphere, which would turn yellow-orange and produce acid rain. With the reduction in photosynthesis, around 60% of food production would collapse, with all the consequences we can imagine for the functioning of biodiversity. Now you know why finding habitable planets is so complicated. Many conditions have to be met, and such a planet would need to be protected from the many dangers of the universe. Now we're off to discover superhabitable worlds. What do they look like? Where are they most likely to be found in the vastness of the universe? Let's discover the characteristics of these worlds, which could be even more conducive to life than our own Earth. Superhabitable worlds, as defined by Heller and Armstrong, are larger than Earth. Superhabitable planets have a mass about two times that of the Earth, and a radius of 1.3, the Earth's radius. According to astrophysicists, this size is optimal for plate tectonics. Superhabitable worlds have a stronger gravitational attraction than the Earth's, allowing for better gas retention during their formation. As a result, their atmospheres are denser, with higher concentrations of oxygen and greenhouse gases. This concentration of gases raises the average temperature to levels of around 25 degrees Celsius, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit which is optimal for the emergence of plant life. Thanks to a denser atmosphere than Earth's, superhabitable worlds have a more regular surface relief, allowing water to cover a larger area while reducing the size of ocean basins. Shallow areas are more conducive to the development of a diversity of marine and aquatic species as they receive more heat and light. A planet with shallower average ocean depths than Earth's would therefore be likely to have greater aquatic biodiversity. These characteristics are basic conditions for a planet to be even more habitable than Earth. The more mass of a planet, the stronger its gravity. The shallower its basins, the more hospitable it is to life. From a geological point of view, the optimum mass of a superhabitable planet is around two Earth masses, with a radius between 1.2 and 1.3 times the Earth's radius, so that the density is close to that of the Earth. Indeed, these are the optimum conditions for plate tectonics, which can occur if the planet has a mass between 1 and 5 times that of the Earth. Ideally, two Earth masses. Plate tectonics is the set of movements of the plates that make up the lithosphere, the Earth's outer solid envelope. These movements are caused by convective movements of the mantle. 
plate tectonics and the presence of large bodies of water are essential conditions for maintaining a constant level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Superhabitable worlds must therefore be geologically active, with geological activity strong enough to generate a sufficient quantity of greenhouse gases. The greenhouse effect is important for raising the planet's overall temperature above the freezing point of water and thus maintaining water in a liquid state. If geological activity were not intense enough to maintain this greenhouse effect, it would have to be compensated for by an internal heat source such as the tidal effect. But this tidal effect would have to be very intense. Tidal heating also poses another problem in the case of superhabitable planets. When one object is in an elliptical orbit around another, the tidal force acting on it is strong. This rotating object is then subject to continuous deformation movements that generate friction inside it. The energy produced by this friction is released in the form of heat and gradually modifies the orbit of the rotating object, which becomes less and less elliptical and more and more circular until it is in synchronous rotation but that's not what we want. A superhabitable planet must by definition present optimal conditions for the emergence and development of life and if the planet is in synchronous rotation, one side of the planet will be very hot and the other very cold. Life could ultimately develop at the boundary between the two hemispheres, but we can't really talk about optimal conditions. This is why we prefer the hypothesis of geological activity intense enough to maintain a greenhouse effect in the case of superhabitable worlds. Let's continue exploring the characteristics of superhabitable planets. The magnetosphere is an important feature of our planet protecting living organisms from the dangers of the universe. Do superhabitable planets have a magnetosphere like the Earth? The Earth generates its own magnetic field. It is therefore surrounded by a magnetic bubble generated by the difference in speed between the rotation of the planet and its liquid core, called the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere protects the planet from external aggressions, such as cosmic rays. Cosmic radiation is the flow of atomic nuclei and high-energy particles circulating in the interstellar medium. It is dangerous for us because it can break DNA and cause cancer or genetic malformations. These rays can also damage our electronic equipment. The magnetosphere also protects our planet from solar winds, streams of particles consisting mainly of ions and electrons, which are ejected from the sun's upper atmosphere. Perhaps you've already heard of the polar aurora? These luminous phenomena visible at high northern or southern latitudes, more commonly referred to as aurora borealis or Aurora Australis, depending on the pole, are magnificent to behold. But they occur when certain particles of the solar wind enter the atmosphere. And solar winds are as dangerous to us as cosmic rays because the storms created by these particles damage our satellites and disrupt radio transmissions. In 1989, a solar windstorm caused a major blackout in Canada and the USA, resulting in major electrical storms and the corrosion of pipelines for several kilometers in Alaska. In fact, solar winds are comparable to radioactive radiation. The Earth is not the only planet surrounded by a magnetosphere. All the planets with magnetic fields such as Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have their own magnetospheres. Venus has none, as it has no internal magnetic field. 
As for Mars, researchers have observed traces of an ancestral magnetic field, which has now disappeared. The red planet may therefore have had its own magnetosphere in the past, but it disappeared, along with its magnetic field. The magnetosphere is essential to protect life on a planet. Superhabitable planets must therefore have a sufficiently powerful magnetosphere, which would act as a shield against cosmic radiation, stellar winds, and other phenomena dangerous to the development of life. The rotation of a superhabitable planet must not be synchronous or too slow, as the magnetosphere would then be too weak. This would cause part of the atmosphere, notably hydrogen, to escape into the atmosphere. This is why planets orbiting in the habitable zone of a red dwarf, which in theory rotates synchronously around their star, cannot be superhabitable planets. Let's continue our exploration of superhabitable worlds. You're probably wondering what the weather is like on these planets, and more importantly, what the climate is like, because climate and biodiversity are closely linked. For a planet to be habitable, it doesn't necessarily have to have exactly the same temperatures and climate as Earth. In fact, we don't know what temperature would be optimal for life on Earth. What we do know is that biodiversity was richer during warmer periods. We can therefore affirm that planets with average temperatures slightly higher than Earth's would be more suitable for the emergence and development of life. The oceans play a major role in regulating a planet's climate. They are in constant exchange with the atmosphere, absorbing and then releasing enormous quantities of heat via currents. An ocean can store a quantity of heat 1,000 times greater than that of the atmosphere and release it very slowly over several centuries. This thermoregulatory effect of the oceans helps to maintain a moderate temperature on the planet's surface conducive to life. Superhabitable planets should be warmer than the Earth but orbit farther from their star than the Earth does from the Sun. Indeed, the Earth is already quite close to the inner edge of the solar system's habitable zone. However, the luminosity of main sequence stars, of which the Sun is a part, increases over time. This pushes the habitable zone outwards. In one to three billion years, the Earth will no longer be habitable. Superhabitable planets must therefore be found closer to the center of the habitable zone. To keep the temperature high, they must have a thicker atmosphere than Earth's and a higher concentration of greenhouse gases. There's another factor to consider when profiling a superhabitable planet, the star around which the planet orbits. The type of star largely determines the characteristics of the stellar system and will therefore influence the habitability of a planet. That's right, because not all stars have the same characteristics or the same lifespan. The most massive stars, type O, B, and A, have very short life cycles and are not suitable for planet formation. So what about the least massive stars, type M and K, which are the most common in the universe? These are the longest lived stars, but their low luminosity reduces the size of the habitable zone. What's more, these stars are notoriously unstable so the planets around them are frequently exposed to flares of ultraviolet radiation. If their atmosphere isn't thick enough, this is a major obstacle to the emergence and development of life. Planets orbiting an M or K-type star 
if they are close together, are in synchronous rotation. We spoke about this earlier in this journey. A planet in synchronous rotation will always present the same side to the star, around which it orbits. As we've seen, you can't call a planet superhabitable if one hemisphere is probably too hot for life and the other too cold. Life on planets orbiting red dwarfs remains possible, but these planets are not superhabitable. The most massive stars and the least massive stars are therefore not all that conducive to the emergence and development of life. K-type stars, or orange dwarfs, are the happy median between these two extremes. Because they are stable over a very long period, they provide the planets orbiting them with a stable, habitable zone, far enough away that the planets are not overly exposed to ultraviolet radiation. Orange dwarfs emit less ultraviolet radiation than red dwarfs, or even the sun. Planets around an orange dwarf don't necessarily need an atmosphere or a protective ozone layer. The star's luminosity is sufficient to allow the development of complex life forms. According to some studies, the stability of the Earth's orbit could be a hindrance to biological evolution. Superhabitable planets could therefore have higher orbital eccentricity, with seasonal, habitable regions or tidal heating. We're now going to study the atmosphere of a superhabitable planet. According to scientists, there is no solid argument that Earth's current atmosphere is the most optimal for the development of life. So most likely, there could be other combinations of elements that are even more conducive to life. Let's take a look at the characteristics of a habitable planet's atmosphere. Animal life as we know it needs an atmosphere with sufficient oxygen. Plant life, on the other hand, needs a sufficient quantity of carbon in the atmosphere, in the form of carbon dioxide, to ensure photosynthesis. A balance in greenhouse gases is essential to maintain a stable, habitable temperature. The Earth's atmosphere is rather unusual. It is rich in nitrogen and oxygen, but very low in CO2. The dominant greenhouse gas is not CO2, but water vapor. This has not always been the case. 4.6 billion years ago, the early Earth's atmosphere consisted mainly of helium and hydrogen. Ward and Brownlee's model indicates that there was then an oxygen revolution. Around 2.5 billion years ago, the formation of continents provided more and more suitable habitats for the development of stromatolites, which released oxygen into the sea. This oxygen remained bound to the iron dissolved in the oceans until around 1.8 billion years ago, when it began to be released into the atmosphere. Prokaryotic bacteria continued to release oxygen into the atmosphere. During the Carboniferous period, the maximum level of oxygen in the atmosphere was estimated at 35% by volume. This same period saw the development of a rich biodiversity. It is therefore assumed that the presence of a significant quantity of oxygen in the atmosphere is essential for the development of complex life forms. We also need to talk about atmospheric density. What would be the optimum density for the development of life? If the atmospheres of superhabitable planets were less dense than Earth's, they would be less protected from cosmic radiation, and there would be very significant thermal differences between day and night, or between equatorial and polar zones. Precipitation would also be more unevenly distributed, resulting in very dry and very wet zones. As you can see, a sparsely populated atmosphere would not be ideal for the development of life. On the other hand, 
an atmosphere denser than Earth's would be more favorable to life. Especially since superhabitable planets are more massive than our planet, and more massive planets must have a higher atmospheric density. At the start of this journey, we talked about the antiquity of superhabitable planets. According to the researchers who theorize the notion of a superhabitable planet, planets older than the Earth could possess greater biodiversity. Not only would species have had more time to evolve, but environmental conditions would have had time to adapt to create even more favorable conditions for life. By the way, remember that superhabitable planets orbit orange dwarfs, which are more stable for longer. The habitable zone of orange dwarfs recedes less rapidly than that of yellow or red dwarfs. Superhabitable planets can therefore be habitable for longer than the Earth. Under these conditions, it doesn't matter if they're older than the Earth. It doesn't mean they're nearing the end of their habitability period. It all depends on the criteria for qualifying as a superhabitable planet. Do you doubt the existence of such planets? Or do you think that if they do exist, there really aren't many of them? Let's go back to the report published in January 2014 in the journal Astrobiology. According to the astrophysicists, there are 24 potential superhabitable planets, so there could be more superhabitable planets than terrestrial planets. In fact, there are more orange dwarf stars than sun-like stars. To calculate this figure, the researchers analyzed the 4,500 exoplanets that had been discovered to date. They first selected planets in stellar habitable zones from the Kepler telescope archive. They then examined systems with K-type stars i.e. orange dwarfs, and G-type stars like the Sun, but cooler, and so on. Criterion by criterion, they ended up with a list of 24 potential superhabitable worlds. Does this figure sound impressive, given the conditions that must be met for planets to be superhabitable? Well, simply by being more massive than Earth, these planets can spontaneously meet many of the criteria we've been talking about. In fact, many of the criteria flow from one another. A planetary body with two to three Earth masses will have more perennial plate tectonics and a larger surface area than the Earth. The effect of gravity on the Earth's crust would not only affect the depth of the oceans, but also the intensity of the gravitational field and the density of the atmosphere. Of these 24 exoplanet candidates for the title of superhabitable planet, only one has been confirmed, Kepler 1126b. What's more, the planets on the list are all more than 100 light years away, which makes observing their characteristics rather complicated. However, this discovery has given astrophysicists great hope, and the new, more powerful telescopes, starting with the James Webb, will certainly be able to tell us more about these planets that may be superhabitable. Wondering which planets are on the list of superhabitable worlds? Fasten your seatbelts, we're off to explore the most remarkable of the superhabitable planets. Before we begin our journey to the heart of the planets, let's take a look at exoplanet Kepler-69c, located 2700 light years from Earth. Kepler-69c was initially thought to be superhabitable, before analyses revealed that it is probably similar to Venus. 
In the end, therefore, it was not considered habitable. And yet, this super-Earth-like planet, orbiting in its star's habitable zone, was at the time of its discovery in 2013, considered one of the most Earth-like planets. Other planets have appeared on the list of superhabitable worlds before being withdrawn, like Kepler-69c. Such is the case of exoplanet HD 85512b, discovered in 2011, 36 light years away, in the constellation of the Veils. When it was discovered, HD 85512b was one of the most habitable exoplanets identified, located at the upper limit of its star's habitable zone. However, the habitable zone models for the star HD 85512 have been updated, and it turns out that the planet is in fact outside the habitable zone. It is therefore not habitable, let alone superhabitable. The same thing happened to the exoplanet Tau Ceti F, located in the Whale constellation. 12 light years from Earth. A pity, since both planets were relatively close to us, which would have facilitated the search for intelligent life. Let's start our exploration of superhabitable planets with Kepler 1126b, the only exoplanet on the list that has been confirmed as superhabitable. Unfortunately, it's a long way from us. It's more than 2,070 light-years from Earth. Discovered in 2016, this exoplanet has been classified as a super-Earth. A super-Earth is an exoplanet with a mass between that of the Earth and that of a giant planet. We could say that all super-inhabitable planets are super-Earths since their mass would have to be around twice that of our planet. We often tend to confuse super-Earths, habitable planets, and superhabitable planets, but these are very different concepts, even if they cross and recross. Kepler 1126b orbits a G-type or yellow dwarf star, like the Sun. Its mass is equivalent to 3.64 times that of the Earth. Located about 0.43 astronomical units from its star, Kepler 1126, and therefore closer to the Sun than the Earth, its orbit is logically shorter, taking 108.6 days. For the record, the exoplanet Kepler 1126b was so named because it was discovered by the American Kepler Space Telescope. Like many others, it was given the name Kepler, followed by a number and the letter B, indicating that it was the first exoplanet discovered around its star. The other exoplanets on the list were also discovered by the Kepler telescope. This telescope, which was launched in 2009 and completed its mission in 2018, had as its main objective to identify all the exoplanets detectable in a given area of the Milky Way. To detect these terrestrial exoplanets, the Kepler telescope used the transit method, which measures the change in brightness of a star when a planet orbiting that star passes between the telescope and the star. By the end of its mission, Kepler had detected 2,662 planets confirmed by other observations, more than half of the exoplanets discovered to date. A large proportion of the more than 5,300 exoplanets discovered by 2023 are therefore named after this Kepler telescope. Let's continue our journey of exploration of superinhabitable worlds. The most promising candidate for a superhabitable planet to date is an exoplanet called KOI 5715.01. Like Kepler 1126b, 
it's still a long way from us. 2,964 light years from our solar system. As far as we know, this planet meets most of the criteria that make an exoplanet a superhabitable world. It's older than Earth at 5.5 billion years compared with 4.5 billion years for our own planet. It is also more massive, 1.8 times larger than Earth. Its equilibrium temperature is slightly higher than Earth's, minus 13 degrees Celsius or 8 degrees Fahrenheit versus minus 18 degrees Celsius or 0 degrees Fahrenheit for our planet. As a reminder, the equilibrium temperature of a planet is the theoretical temperature of its surface, assuming it is uniform, in the absence of atmosphere. These data should be treated with caution, as KOI 5715.01's atmosphere has not yet been analyzed. Indeed, it is still impossible to measure the composition of the atmosphere of this planet, which is very far from the Earth. Let's continue our exploration with exoplanet KOI 4878.01. This planet is located some 1,075 light years from Earth in the constellation of the Dragon. It orbits an F-type star, a type of main sequence star we haven't yet encountered on this trip. F-type stars are brighter than the Sun, with fainter hydrogen lines in their spectrum than A-type stars such as Sirius, the brightest star in our night sky, but stronger than G-type stars like the Sun. Known F-type stars include the Alpha Star in the Little Dipper, which you probably know as the Pole Star. In fact, the second brightest star in our night sky after Sirius is a spectral F-type star called Canopus. It's the only star whose brilliance can rival Sirius. Let's return to KOI 4878.01. This exoplanet has been classified as a superhabitable planet because it has characteristics very similar to those of Earth, and even better in some respects. Its orbital period is higher than Earth's, as it orbits its star in 449 Earth days, it is probably slightly more massive than Earth, with a mass of between 0.4 and 3 Earth masses. Its radius is slightly greater than that of our planet, at 1.05 Earth radii. The equilibrium temperature of KOI 4878.01 is around 16.5 degrees Celsius, or 3 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very slightly higher than that of the Earth at minus 18 degrees Celsius or 0 degrees Fahrenheit. If we assume that KOI 4878.01's atmosphere were similar to Earth's, then its surface temperature would be slightly higher at 17.85 degrees Celsius or 62 degrees Fahrenheit versus 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit on Earth. Ideal conditions for life. As for its star, it's slightly less massive than the Sun, but 5% larger, with a higher temperature of 5,758 degrees Celsius or 10,396 degrees Fahrenheit, compared with 5,000 498 degrees Celsius or 9,928 degrees Fahrenheit for the Sun. Although the star's age is unknown, astrophysicists believe it to be older than the Sun, given its metallicity and relatively high space velocity.
Among the 24 exoplanets classified as superhabitable worlds is KOI 456.04, located just over 3,000 light years from our solar system in the Lyra constellation. KOI 456.04 orbits a star called Kepler-160, whose mass and radius are very close to those of the Sun. Kepler-160 has a surface temperature 300 degrees Celsius or 539 degrees Fahrenheit lower than the Sun. This star is at the heart of a multi-planetary system with at least three exoplanets orbiting it. It's not the first two planets discovered. In 2010, Kepler-160b and Kepler-160c that interest us today, as they are relatively close to the star and therefore far too hot to be habitable. On the other hand, the third planet, Kepler-160d, or KOI 456.04, detected in 2020 by a team from the Max Planck Institute is classified as a superhabitable planet. This planet was detected thanks to the observation of minute variations in the orbital period of Kepler 160c. KOI 456.04 is a rocky planet with a mass slightly less than twice that of the Earth. It orbits its star in 378 days, slightly longer than the Earth. It receives 93% of the light that the Earth receives from the Sun and is located at a distance from its star that could allow surface temperatures favorable to the emergence of life, if the other conditions are met, of course. Astrophysicists don't have much more information on this promising but very distant exoplanet. Kepler-160d shows no transits in its star's light curve. Analyses have therefore been based on indirect data. Researchers can, however, put forward a number of hypotheses. If KOI 456.04's atmosphere is essentially inert, i.e. made up of non-reactive gases such as nitrogen or CO2, and has a slight greenhouse effect, then the planet's surface temperature could average plus 5 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit, i.e. 10 degrees Celsius or 18 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than that of Earth. All this, of course, remains speculation. In fact, astrophysicists are still not even sure that KOI 456.04 is a real planet and not a statistical error. Its discovery is very recent, and at such a distance it's hard to be certain. According to researchers, there is an 85% chance that KOI 456.04 is a real planet. To be officially recognized as a planet, however, the probability must reach 99%. To find out for sure, we'll have to wait for the launch of ESA's PLATO space mission in 2024. The PLATO mission, which stands for Planetary Transits and Oscillations of Stars, will study planetary transits and stellar oscillations over a six-year period. Its primary objective is the discovery of Earth-sized planets around Sun-like stars. Let's continue our exploration with a planet called KOI 7711.01. Located 1700 light years away, this planet is close to the size of Earth and orbits a star that is similar to our Sun. Its discovery was announced on June 19, 2017 by NASA during a presentation of the latest extrasolar planets found during the Kepler mission. However, at present, 
not much is known about this planet. We don't even know if it contains liquid water. And even if it looks like Earth's twin sister, without knowing its atmospheric conditions, we can't really say with any certainty that this planet is habitable or even superhabitable. All the other planets on the list of superhabitable worlds are similar to KOI 7711.01 in the sense that very little data is currently available on them. As new discoveries are made, these superhabitable planets like HD 85512b or Tau Ceti F could eventually be removed from the list. Another example is the exoplanet KOI 5554.01. This exoplanet, located 701 light years from us, was discovered relatively recently, so information is still lacking. However, it has been classified as a superinhabitable world because it is about 1.29 times larger than Earth. But it's also older than our planet, being 6.5 billion years, 2 billion years older. Once again, this information should be taken with a grain of salt, as astrophysicists have yet to confirm it. There could be a margin of error of the order of billions of years. As you can see, everything is still very uncertain. We also know that the average temperature of this planet should be around 26 degrees Celsius or 78 degrees Fahrenheit, some 10 degrees warmer than on Earth, which is favorable for being considered a superhabitable planet. For the moment, we don't know any more, but astrophysicists should soon be taking a closer look at this exoplanet, which is nonetheless less distant than some of the other superhabitable planets on the list. It's all very well looking for habitable planets, but let's suppose that one day we find a superhabitable planet in the universe that harbors intelligent life and a rich and varied biodiversity. Could we get there? Could we live there and rebuild our civilization? It's a question that many people ask themselves, and one that you may already have asked yourself one day. When our planet reaches the end of its lifespan, will it be possible to find another planet with similar or even more favorable conditions on which to perpetuate humanity? Under current scientific conditions, Reaching an extrasolar planet is impossible. Take the example of NASA's New Horizons probe, which was sent out to explore Pluto and its satellites between 2006 and 2015. This probe traveled 3 billion kilometers, or 1.8 billion miles in nine and a half years. To enable the probe to reach Pluto, located at the edge of our solar system, Within a reasonable time frame, the probe's launcher achieved a speed record for the time, 45 kilometers per second, or 28 miles per second. Without gravitational assistance, it would have taken the probe more than 20 years to reach Pluto. Now, imagine trying to reach this dwarf planet by plane with our current terrestrial means. It would take us 732 years. And even then, Pluto remains a dwarf planet in our solar system, and it's the extrasolar planets we're interested in, some of which are located 3,000 light years away, whereas a single light year represents 9.65 trillion kilometers. At the speed of NASA's New Horizons probe, it would take 19,000 years to cover just one light year, a dizzying calculation. Here's another example to illustrate the difficulty of this problem. The closest planet to Earth is Proxima b, 
located just 4.24 light years away, which seems paltry compared with the distances to which our superhabitable planets are located. But despite being located in the habitable zone of its star, and probably telluric like Earth, Proxima b is not a superhabitable planet. It orbits a red dwarf. To reach Proxima b at the speed of our current probes, i.e. 15 kilometers per second, or 9 miles per second, would take 60,000 years. However, astrophysicists are not giving up hope of one day reaching an extrasolar planet. There are other technologies that could make this kind of trip possible more quickly. But the few leads we have need to be perfected. And the technology that will be used when such a journey is finally undertaken is certainly yet to be discovered. One of today's most advanced technologies is ionic propulsion. Ion propulsion engines extract electrons from a fluid such as xenon, then use electric and magnetic fields to accelerate. This technology was used on ESA's Smart One probe, which flew between 2003 and 2006. After a certain acceleration time, Ion propulsion engines can reach an impressive speed of 60 kilometers per second or 37 miles per second. However, if we hope to reach Proxima b within a reasonable time frame, say less than 40 years, we'd have to carry a ton of cargo, a mass greater than the entire universe. So we can't really consider this technology to be the ideal solution for getting to a superhabitable planet one day. Scientists are currently studying other propulsion technologies, and although they are far from operational, they are advanced enough to offer hope. The Vasimir motor for variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket is one such promising technology. This engine can deliver high thrust while retaining a high specific impulse, which was not the case with the ion propulsion engine. NASA is working on this engine with a view to reaching Mars. After all, there's a gulf between Earth's neighbor and a superhabitable planet over 2,500 light years away. Perhaps in the decades to come, other propulsion technologies will enable us to reach closer planets, and little by little, will be able to push back the boundaries of science. There are still other avenues to explore, such as antimatter, which is made up of negative protons, antiprotons, and positive electrons, positrons. Antimatter is very expensive to manufacture, and we don't know how to store it, but it has extraordinary potential, especially in terms of energy. We could also artificially create a magnetosphere that would act like a magnetic sail and move through the universe, propelled by the solar wind. The feasibility of solar sail propulsion has already been demonstrated and is even the basis of the Breakthrough Starshot project, launched in 2016 and supported by astrophysicist Stephen Hawking. This project aims to send thousands of space probes, weighing around one gram, equipped with solar sails to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system to us, where Proxima Centauri b is located. Developing the technology to travel so far into space is very complicated. Finding a technology fast enough to make the trip on the scale of a human lifetime isn't the only problem facing scientists. We also need to be able to communicate from one planet to another, and traveling signals from one planet to another adds to the difficulties. And that's just the beginning of the long list of details that need to be considered for a project of this scale.
We've now come to the end of this exciting journey into the heart of super-inhabitable worlds. Yes, our universe certainly contains planets with conditions even more favorable to life than Earth. But have they been discovered? How far will we have to go to find them? Will we ever be able to prove that superhabitable worlds harbor intelligent life? Will we ever be able to travel there? All these questions divide the scientific community. In any case, what we can say is that superinhabitable worlds have yet to reveal all their secrets. And we may not yet be ready to discover what they will reveal when the time comes. <laughs>